so we've got another extraordinary talk coming in now, I know. Um, uh, it's the G Group Achievement Award uh, to Professor Tim Wright from the University of Leeds, and he's going to talk about monitoring our dynamic planet using satellite geodesy. Tim. Okay, so I'm actually going to talk about... Uh, so the award was to uh, an organisation that I'm uh, privileged to run called Comet, which... Uh, it's very confusing in a Royal Astronomical Society meeting, especially when we've had a talk about asteroids. Um, so Comet is the Centre for the Observation and Modelling of Earthquakes, Volcanoes and Tectonics, and it's a collaboration involving scientists in now nine universities um, across the UK, along with the British Geological Survey. And I'm going to try and summarise some of the things we do within in Comet um, uh, for you and explain what, what we do. So what, what is Comet? Um, we've actually existed for a long time. It was founded back in 2002 um, as an Earth Observation Centre of Excellence funded by the Natural Environment Research Council. At that point, just focused on earthquakes and tectonics um, and, and just in Oxford, Cambridge and UCL. In um, 2008, we became part of the National Centre for Earth Observation. We incorporated volcanoes and we also incorporated Reading, Leeds, Bristol and Glasgow um, and then in 2014 we were split out of the National Centre for Earth Observation and now we're part of uh, uh, the British Geological Survey. We have a partnership with the British Geological Survey and we also um, dragged along a few other universities as well and I guess there's been a transition from just doing pure science to what NERC refers to as national capability uh, work. So national capability is, the, is really as far as we're concerned services, facilities um, national good services and long-term science um, that NERC deems uh, important for, uh, for the UK. So perhaps a better way of, of saying what we are is to say who we are. And so we have 21 scientists in nine UK universities and the British Geological Survey, 20 associates in, um, as well um, linked to Comet. We employ uh, staff scientists, around eight staff scientists that are co-funded by Comet, we have a, another 10 or so associated postdocs and about 50 PhD students who consider themselves part of Comet, even though we, we only pay for about three of them. So that's, what, that's one of our successes is being able to leverage uh, uh, buy-in from, from other people. Um, so I, I, I'm in the process, actually, of, of putting in our renewal bid, so doing quite a, a lot of thinking about what Comet is and why it's, why it's important uh, to continue funding it. Um, and I think what's interesting about Comet is we're not pure science, so we really do the, these four things. Uh, we, do pure, we do do pure scientific research, um, both into the satellite um, observations um, of earthquakes and tectonics and volcanoes, but also into the, the physical processes themselves. We really do a lot of work on, on data and providing data for the community, generating new data sets. We're a community, um, and we also think about broader impacts. So we, and all of those are important. So I'm going to try and take us through those and, and also emphasize how they link to each other, really. So you know, we, we're developing methods for exploiting Earth observation data, and particularly for looking at the, the deformation of the solid Earth, for measuring gas and ash that come out of volcanoes, and for measuring topography. Um, and we use that um, to deliver services to provide data um, in near real time to the scientific community. Um, and we also have a wide range of expertise, both in terms of people within the UK, but also partnerships with scientists in at-risk at, at regions around the world. And so when there's an event, um, an earthquake or a volcanic eruption, we're extremely well placed to be able to respond to that event uh, very, very quickly. Um, um, by doing that response, we also then generate new science. So it's a kind of, um, it's, it's a beneficial uh, um, synergies between all of these different aspects of what we do. So I'm going to go through them one by one and, and, and try and isolate them, then I'd come at the end and, and talk about a few examples that, that bring some of those, uh, those aspects together. So uh, Comet has been involved in about 260 papers since 2014, so we're, we're highly productive. Um, the kinds of things we do um, in earthquakes and, and tectonics really are about making observations uh, using satellites primarily. At the top here, we've got an example of some satellite geodesy measuring the deformation due to uh, an earthquake, in this case, with repeated radar acquisitions. 
Um, we also use GNSS, uh, systems like GPS and seismology to measure, measure uh, uh, earthquakes as they happen. We try and um, put all those with surface observations into models of the subsurface and try and link that then to what might happen in future, in the future in terms of ongoing seismic hazard, but also how individual earthquakes link to, to make mountains and to create the landscape that we live in. As well as measuring what happens in individual earthquakes, we look at how the earth deforms between earthquakes. So this is, this is a map of eastern Turkey, showing the North Anatolian Fault here and the East Anatolian Fault here, and Turkey's <coughs> being kind of squeezed out sideways as Arabia collides with Europe. And this change in colour in these radar interferograms is a measurement of, from space of the motion of the, of the Anatolian tectonic plate. And on a much smaller scale, we also look at high-resolution uh, optical images of features on the ground, and we go into the field, and comet scientists go and measure uh, scarps like this, which are associated with individual uh, earthquakes that have either happened recently or sometimes thousands of years ago. We'll dig trenches across those and try and work out the history of when those earthquakes happened on individual faults. And we try and put all that information into models of process, really, to try and understand how earthquakes work, how the tectonic cycles work, um, particularly on continental faults. The key questions we're interested in are very kind of broad picture questions. You know, what's the distribution of strain and hazard in the continents? How does seismic hazard vary in space and time, particularly after a big earthquake? And, and really, how does the whole system work? What's the mechanical structure of the continental lithosphere, the, the part of the Earth we live on? So we also work on, on volcanoes, and we have a, a similar set of observables. One that's different is that we also use, um, use uh, satellites to make direct measurements of volcanic ash and volcanic gas, in particular sulfur dioxide. And this, this is a, a one animation from, from one eruption. Again, we're looking at deformation measurements using satellite radar. This is an example from the Galapagos. These beautiful colored fringes here show that this part near the volcanic summit actually subsided, and this part to the south went up. And in this case, that meant that the magma wasn't coming out uh, shall shallower, wasn't coming towards the surface. It was actually moving horizontally. And that observation enabled a local scientists to lower the alert level. It was used in conjunction with other information. We also make high-resolution topogra topographic measurements, again, trying to understand volcanic histories in, in individual locations. And again, we try and put all that information into models. This is one model of a big eruption that happened um, in, in Iceland a couple of years ago, um, showing uh, the model prediction compared to observations of, of ground deformation. And the key questions, again, what are the patterns of deformation and degassing and how do they relate to the hazard? So it's really linking, though, again, the same as in the earthquake problem. We're trying to link the fundamental science to things that uh, decision makers care about, which is what is, what is the hazard? Um, how is this volcano going to kill me in the long run? Um, how does that hazard vary in space and time during periods of volcanic activity? And a volcanic period of unrest might last uh, months or years. So an earthquake happens like that, typically, but really actually monitoring a volcanic event as it's, on, as it's happening can be a, a long-term endeavour. And then how do we build models that generalise those processes to understand volcanic behaviour? So Comet's real key observations are um, from satellites. So as I said, we use uh, satellite radars. This is a satellite called Sentinel-1, uh, funded by the, uh, the European, uh, European Commission, um, and that's, that's really providing vast volumes of data that we're able to use to measure deformation at tectonic faults and at volcanoes. We use infrared and ultraviolet spectrometers to measure uh, volcanic gas and ash. This one is, um, has, is one of the meteorological satellites. I forget the name, but it has an instrument called IASI on it, which is one that we use, uh, particularly scientists at Oxford um, in atmospheric physics are using that instrument. Um, and uh, this is a satellite that's used to measure very high-resolution optical imagery. This is a satellite called Pleiades, um, and uh, a French satellite that provides imagery with uh, less than a metre spatial resolution and from different angles. And by looking at those images from different angles, we can build up 3D models of the Earth's surface. Uh, but I think as well as the expertise in the, in the 
satellite observations, what really makes Comet unique is that we have strength in combining that expertise with um, knowledge of what's going on on the ground, knowledge of these volcanic and tectonic processes, and really we have people who go out and get their boots muddy, really make proper measurements in the field of, of these events, and we bring all those things together to understand the processes. So that's, that's a very broad overview of the science. Um, just to emphasize some of the data sets that we produce, one of, one of our aims is to make using these Earth observation data sets easier, uh, so you don't have to be an expert in radar processing in order to use measurements of the surface deformation. So if you go to the Comet website, there's links to various data sets. I'm, I'm just going to emphasize a couple of those. Um, one is an interactive portal that's come through a project called, uh, called LIX, uh, that Comet uh, co-funds, and that is a project that's taking data from Sentinel-1, making measurements, making uh, these radar interfer interferograms over very large regions and providing those data um, for free to the, uh, to the uh, scientific and, well, actually to anybody. You can go there. You can click on one of these frames, download hundreds of interferograms. Um, some of them include earthquakes like this one. This is an earthquake that happened in, in Iran uh, a couple of years ago. And the volcanic gas information is provided, again, through an interactive portal. This is just a screen grab I took on the, on the train down from Leeds today of, of the, uh, the, um, the SO2 currently being measured, so no significant volcanic outgassing, just a little bit of SO2 down here um, uh, today. But this, is, this data set is really a vital for kind of real-time response to volcanic events. And particularly, uh, we all know the kind of impact of, of, of volcanic ash can have on aviation after the uh, 2010 uh, eruption of the unpronounceable volcano in, in Iceland. Um, so we try and make those data sets easier for people to use. Um, I think a really important part of what we do is the community building. So we have an annual meeting that's attended by 80 to 100 people. Uh, we have a student-led science meeting that we get those 50 uh, Comet PhD students to come along to. We do a range of training events, so this is just a photograph from earlier this week of a, a training event where we had 50 people from all over the world lear learning about radar interferometry um, in Leeds. Uh, we also do training on GPS, on topography. Um, we do training for scientists from developing countries. Um, so what has all that community building really achieved? And I think one of the things that's happened over the, over the 15 years or so that Comet's been in existence is that Earth observation science is now really embedded within the UK Earth observation, uh, within the UK Earth science community. So most geology departments have people who use these kind of um, technologies as a fundamental part of their everyday science. Um, we've trained now several hundred students and scientists in, in the latest techniques. Um, and I think this comet provides a focus for the tectonic and volcanic community in the UK, which means we're able to communicate with uh, organisations like the European Space Agency and give a single voice for, for how we want the, uh, the satellites to acquire data for us. So the community is a really important part of what we do. I've now got a few examples of the kind of broader impacts that we have. Um, so one is involved in, in civil protection. So obviously when we're, we're working on earthquakes and volcanoes, we really, we really want to make a difference and, and help people live with these hazardous um, events and uh, locations around the world. I've got a couple of examples here. This is a photograph from the Nepal earthquake um, three years ago uh, in which after that earthquake, we worked we work closely with the Department for International Development we were able to brief the government uh, science committee um, in, in response to that event and, and we also work with local Nepalese scientists. And within the BGS uh, part of, of Comet, we also were involved in landslide uh, mapping. And, and this was really important in this case because actually the earthquake in, in Nepal only ruptured uh, half of the fault that we were expecting it to fail. So there's a real... Uh, urgency to understand what happened and, and what hadn't happened and, and the ongoing hazard there is, is still extremely high in, in Nepal. The photograph in the bottom uh, right is actually one of the, the largest eruptions that's happened for about 200 years on, on the planet. It was, it was um, the, uh, I guess eruptions uh, tend to be categorised and I, I've stolen this, this uh, phrase from one of my colleague David Ferguson but you either 
you either have uh, disasters or you have tourist uh, eruptions. And this was more of a tourist eruption. Nobody was killed, uh, but it did emit vast volumes of, of, of gas uh, into the atmosphere, but, but not, uh, not very, very high. Very beautiful eruption, but it lasted about eight months and put out uh, uh, more than a, a, a cubic kilometre of, of magma. A lot of magma came out of the surface there. And during that long eruption, we were able to monitor that using satellite radar, working with, again, Icelandic partners, and to integrate that to actually provide information about how long this eruption might last. We also work before events, so um, we obviously want to be prepared for this. And we've got a number of examples of comet scientists. So my, my colleague, uh, Jürgen Neuberg, is the chair of the Montserrat Volcan Volcano Science Advisory Committee. In fact, he's there this week. Um, and they report both to, to the local governor and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in the UK. Um, we have close collaboration with earthquake scientists and civil protection authorities throughout the Alpine Himalayan belt, so from Italy through to China, um, through a number of projects, including a, a big project that's uh, just finished called Earthquakes Without Frontiers and a programme that NERC ran about increasing resilience to natural hazards. And we have lots of partnerships with volcano observatories and monitoring organisations in the Caribbean, uh, Latin America and East Africa through a number of projects, including Strever and, and Riftvolk. So we do a lot of work um, on, with, uh, with civil defence organisations around the world. Um, we also do a lot of um, work with, with the media. Uh, here's a kind of few examples. So uh, this is a, a BBC article about uh, an earthquake in New Zealand that I'll talk about later. Um, this was actually on at the end of News at 10. Actually, this, this story made News at 10 uh, twice. So this is Rebecca Morell, uh, BBC science reporter, who uh, went up uh, um, Etna as part of uh, this story. And unfortunately, there was a little eruption while she was up there. And they, they actually had a very lucky escape from that eruption. So it was on the news because of the, her lucky escape. And then it was on the news again with the actual report of the science. But you know, we managed to get Sentinel-1 and some of our work on, on News at 10. And then some, some of the media coverage isn't, isn't quite so uh, helpful. Um, so uh, um, we do a lot of outreach activities. Um, so comet scientist Clive Oppenheimer was involved in this uh, fabulous uh, Werner Herzog uh, movie that I recommend you watching if, if you haven't seen it. Uh, we do work uh, um, providing educational materials about how faults and earthquakes work, uh, science books. This is a, a volcano that, that toured the country that uh, comet scientists at Oxford were involved with. We had an exhibition on volcanoes. This is actually my, my son uh, and some outreach we do in, in schools about learning how to build resilient buildings um, using straws and marshmallows. Um, <laughs> extremely difficult to get a bunch of, of, of seven-year-olds to build something with marshmallows rather than eat them, <laughs> as, you, as you might imagine. Um, so we also work on uh, we've, some of the spin-offs of what we've done uh, have been some economic uh, benefits. So at Leeds, we've just formed a small spin-out company that's using the same radar technology um, as we use for earthquakes and, te and tectonics, but for measuring very small-scale deformation in the UK and elsewhere. So here's a couple of examples. I, sh I showed this one, I think, last year, um, showing uh, this is London, this is here's the river, we're, what, we're somewhere here, right? Um, and this, this red line running through there, yeah, that's the route of the crossrail uh, tunnel uh, as that was formed. And so these are measurements from Sentinel-1 between 2015 and 2016. <coughs> if you look at the deformation in 2017, we, we can't see crossrail anymore. That, that's finished and, and settled down. But you can see this signal down here, which is the northern line um, extension that's going across uh, to Battersea. Here. So we can get these very dynamic measurements of, of how um, the UK is deforming. And we, form, uh, we work with a number of organisations around the world, so we try and get our information and our data into a wide range of, uh, of projects, um, and I, I don't have time to talk about all of those, but really want to emphasise that actually having an organisation like Comet enables us to have this very large reach and really increases the influence of, of UK science. And again, just to emphasise, I think it's the combination of all these, 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 these facets of Comet's activity which, which uh, give us um, our strength. Um, so I want to, end, want to end with a couple of uh, case studies of some of the work we've, we've done, again, showing how the, these different aspects link. 
Um, the first is at two volcanoes called Chiles and Cerro Negro in, uh, on the Ecuador-Colombia border. And here we had an intense seismic swarm that began in October 2014. So there's a lot of concern about whether these volcanoes would, would erupt. And, um, and initially, the earthquakes were interpreted as, as being associated with, with uh, magma unrest, so that with, with molten rock moving towards the surface. So comet scientist uh, Susie Admire, who actually was a former comet PhD student, and now she's faculty at the University of Leeds. But at the time she did this work, she was um, um, a comet uh, research scientist. She was able to work uh, uh, on the satellite radar data to very quickly look at the radar observations and to build a model of what was happening in the subsurface. Um, and she worked directly in the offices of the Institute, Instituto Geophysico in Quito, um, the body responsible for civil defence. So she was actually embedded in that organisation. And on the, base, on the basis of, of the comet data and models, along with the additional local information, the alert level was, was, was lowered uh, for this event. And this then all leads back to, uh, um, to scientific papers as well. Um, so there's a kind of synergy between all of that, that activity within, within comet. Um, Another example is, is a big earthquake that happened in, in New Zealand, called the Kaikoura earthquake on the South Island of New Zealand, which happened in November 2017, a, a really spectacular earthquake. Here's, um, here's an aerial photograph of the fault rupture, uh, fault running through there, it's fairly easy to spot. Um, it's about 10 metres of offset uh, caused in this individual earthquake. This house was ripped off its uh, foundations. Um, the earthquake only killed about two people. I think there were people inside this house when it happened, and they, they were fine. Um, <laughs> well, they were shaken up, I guess. It's a, um, so, um, sorry. Um, the, um, so, but this, this uh, earthquake caused intense, uh, intense shaking over a really large region, over more than 200 kilometers wide. And there was a lot of uncertainty of what had happened in this individual event. And again, Comet was able to get involved by rapidly analyzing data, in this case, from the Sentinel-1 satellite, um, we're now in a position where within a few hours of the satellite passing over an organ a location, we can make these kind of measurement maps showing very large movements. These pink lines were a very initial interpretation of which faults had failed, showing actually it was a complicated array of faults that had moved. And again, there was a benefit here that we actually worked with a former Comet PhD student, uh, Ian Hamling, who is actually based in New Zealand now. Um, and uh, the Okay. The results uh, showed that this earthquake had really, was really surprising. It behaved in a way that was much more complex than, than anyone had expected it, uh, uh, the Earth to behave, rupturing all these faults simultaneously, probably some offshore faults as well. And actually, most seismic hazard models don't allow for earthquakes like this. So the, the paper that we wrote uh, that was led by um, Ian, Ian um, published in Science, is now really quite an influential publication in terms of actually influencing future seismic hazard codes around the world. So I just wanted to end there by, again, thanking all my uh, brilliant collaborators with, within Comet. Um, it's a really fantastic team uh, to lead and a great honour to have received this award from the RAS. So thank you. Well, that was a fascinating talk. Uh, questions at the back, uh, Steve. Apologies if I missed it, but could you say what scale of deformations you're actually measuring in London with the uh, underground tunnelling? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So I, uh, I probably didn't put a scale bar on, but so these these motions are about uh, the the colour bar saturates at about plus or minus two millimetres per year. So the crossrail total subsidence if you, is about two or three centimetres in most places, a bit higher in, in some places. Yeah. For very, very small signals in general. Other questions? Dare I? Oh, Lindsay. In the case of earthquakes, can you translate that deformation into a kind of magnitude of earthquakes that you can detect the effects of? Yeah, well, there's, I guess there's two aspects to that. So we can, if we, let's, let's look at a picture of an earthquake. So these really big earthquakes are really easy to see. These are meters of, of motion <coughs> in an individual 
event. But of course, with an earthquake being a logarithmic scale, as you go down to a, something like a magnitude five earthquake, you start to get about, depends on how deep the earthquake is. So a shallow magnitude five earthquake you can detect might give you a few centimeters of ground motion. But I guess the more challenging part is we really want to measure the slow buildup of ground movement between earthquakes, um, as, well as, the, um, as well as the movement in earthquakes. And there we can be talking about, again, millimeters per year spread over distances of hundreds of uh, kilometers sometimes, or certainly tens of kilometers. And that's one of the reasons for processing this vast amount of data um, with our, this automatic processing, is to try and really throw uh, all of our computational resources at this to try and measure these really small signals. Well, perhaps I could ask uh, the dreaded question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if Brexit doesn't go <laughs> terribly, terribly well, yeah. uh, are you going to be in difficulty getting some of this data from, from the Copernicus program yeah. and things like that? Yeah, well, obviously, we hope that Brexit... Well, I hope Brexit doesn't happen at all. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there we are. But um, <laughs> that's... Uh, sorry. Okay, that's... <laughs> I'll probably split the audience there. I apologise for any Brexiteers in the audience. But, uh, but um, I think the two answers to that. One is it's, uh, the, the European Commission has a free and open data policy, so the, the data are available to anyone from anywhere in the world. But the Copernicus programme, I think the UK pays something like 13% of the overall budget. So withdrawing from that will make a major impact on the programme, and it, and it will also... Uh, reduce our impact to influence the mission. We come, it was Comet that actually set the tectonic footprint mask for the, for the Sentinel-1 mission, for example. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay, thank okay. You. let's thank Tim again. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, thank you.